a 13-year-old boy who wears an orange-brown toupee and carries three boxes of Kleenex on himself, a middle-aged man who films everything, including his meals, and disrupts a conga line to get a better angle to film on, and an overly tan cruise director who tells a story of his wife being suctioned into the ship's toilet. These are just some scenes in David Foster Wallace's essay titled, A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. It's the title essay in this book, which includes seven essays from David Foster Wallace and was published in 1997, 11 years before his death. The essay was an assignment from Harper's Magazine, a directionless essay-ish thing David Foster Wallace said of it. The magazine spent over $3,000 to send Wallace on a seven-night luxury Caribbean cruise called the Nadir, a ship so white it was nearly blinding. For many people, such a job might seem fun or rejuvenating, but for Wallace, it was the exact opposite. To begin, he had a dreadful fear of the ocean, which saw him imagining shark fins when he had his meals. But mostly, it seems that the cruise's promise of pampering seemed infantilizing. He said, I felt as bleak as I felt since puberty and have filled almost three Mead notebooks, trying to figure out whether it was them or just me. Wallace goes on to note that the connection between the word pamper and an infant's diaper are less than coincidental. The whole 97-page essay is filled with sharp and complex observations, many of which are laugh-out-loud worthy, like this scene about David Foster Wallace's baggage. And so, but, I come out and spot my duffel bag among the luggage, and I start to grab it and haul it out of the towering pile of nylon and leather with the idea I can just whisk the bag back to 1009 myself and root through it and find my good old zinc oxide. And one of the porters sees me starting to grab the bag, and he dumps all four of the massive pieces of luggage he's staggering with and leaps to intercept me. At first, I'm afraid he thinks I'm some kind of baggage thief and wants to see my claim check or something, but it turns out that what he wants is my duffel. He wants to carry it to 1009 for me, and I, who am about half this poor herniated little guy's size, as is the duffel bag itself, protests politely, trying to be considerate, saying, don't fret, not a big deal, just need my good old zinc oxide. I indicate to the porter that I can see they have some sort of incredibly organized ordinal luggage dispersal system underway here, and I don't mean to disrupt it or make him carry a lot seven bag to a lot two or anything, and no, I'll just get the big old heavy weather stain sucker out of here myself and give the little guy that much less work to do. And then now, a very strange argument indeed ensues, me versus the Lebanese porter, because it turns out I am putting this guy, who barely speaks English, in a terrible kind of sedulous service double bind. A paradox of pampering, the passenger's always right versus never let a passenger carry his own baggage paradox. Clueless at the time about what this poor little Lebanese man is going through, I wave off both his high-pitched protests and his agonized expression as mere servile courtesy. Only later did I understand what I'd done. Only later did I learn that that little Lebanese Deck 10 porter had his head just about chewed off by the also Lebanese Deck 10 head porter, who had his own head chewed off by the Austrian chief steward, who'd received confirmed reports that a Deck 10 passenger had been seen carrying his own luggage up to the port hallway of Deck 10 and now demanded rolling Lebanese heads for this clear indication of porterly derelictation. He said the whole incident was incredibly frazzling and angst fraught and filled almost a whole Mead notebook and here is recounted only in its barest psychoskeleton outline. <laughs> When I first read that passage, I chuckled out loud in public. I find it really interesting that what David Foster Wallace seems to find despair in, his audience reacts to with humor and laughter. I think that that's because of his accuracy in perception, his sharp observations of paradoxes. 
In Infinite Jest, his famous novel, he said that he had set out to write a sad novel, but it was mostly received with humor, and in a couple interviews he said he didn't fully understand that humor. Like in Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace makes use of annotations. His footnotes in this essay are so long that they fail to remain footnotes. They are entire pages, as you can see right here. And this technique, as far as I understand, at least began purposeful. It was a way to fracture the text and change the structure of the reading experience. One of my favorite passages in this essay is actually a footnote, and it's on the professional smile and the professional scowl, which I will read to you. This is related to the phenomenon of the professional smile, a national pandemic in the service industry, and no place in my experience have I been on the receiving end as as many professional smiles as I am on the nadir. Their PSs all come on like switches at my approach. But also back on land, at banks, restaurants, airline ticket counters, on and on. You know this smile, the strenuous contraction of circumoral fascia with incomplete zygomatic involvement. The smile that doesn't quite reach the smiler's eyes and signifies nothing more than a calculated attempt to advance the smiler's own interest by pretending to like the smiley. Why do employers and supervisors force professional service workers to broadcast the professional smile? Am I the only consumer in whom high doses of such a smile produce despair? Am I the only person who's sure that the growing number of cases in which totally average looking people suddenly open up with automatic weapons in shopping malls and insurance offices and medical complexes and McDonald's's is somehow causally related to the fact that these venues are well-known dissemination loci of the professional smile? Who do they think is fooled by the professional smile? And yet the professional smile's absence now also causes despair. Anybody who's ever bought a pack of gum from a Manhattan cigar store, or asked for something to be stamped fragile at a Chicago post office, or tried to obtain a glass of water from a South Boston waitress, knows well the soul-crushing effect of a service worker's scowl. In other words, the humiliation and resentment of being denied the professional smile. And the professional smile has now even skewed my resentment at the dreaded professional scowl. I walk away from the Manhattan tobacconist, resenting not the counterman's character or absence of goodwill, but his lack of professionalism in denying me the professional smile. What a f***ing mess. The rest of this essay is filled with similar absurdities, paradoxes and insights. At one point, David Foster Wallace gets beaten at chess by a precocious nine-year-old girl. He goes to great lengths to discover how his cabin is cleaned within precisely 30 minutes, but never actually catches anyone in the act of cleaning. But he also experiences extreme self-consciousness when on the pier of the Cayman Islands. As a writer, Wallace seems to be concerned about Americans' privilege and simultaneous discontent. I think that this is David Foster Wallace's most popular essay because it's incredibly funny, it has some interesting observations on everyday social interactions, and because David Foster Wallace takes such an agonizing interpretation on something so many would consider enjoyable. As the title suggests, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again reveals the ways in which ideas of fun are anything but. Until next time, keep making stuff that matters. David Waster, David Wasterfallis. <laughs>